The first reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, on page 1065 on your Bibles, which you'll find in the keys. John 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And our second reading is from Acts chapter 9 on page 1102. Page 1102. Acts chapter 9 beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptised, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Please do keep your Bibles open on page 1102. We'll be looking at that Acts 9 passage together this morning. One of my favourite things is a bargain. 
Whenever I go to the supermarket, I like to kind of walk up and down the aisles with my eyes scanning for those yellow labels that mark reduced items. Is anyone else the same? I, I remember our church apprentice, Hugh, from a few years back, and he said to me um, that as far as possible, he would like to make his lunches out of those items. Doesn't matter what it was, he loved a bargain. Wilted iceberg lettuce and sweet and sour noodles, why not? To use a nerdy economics term, the reason we love a bargain is because they give us a large consumer surplus. We pay far less for them than they are worth, than the value they provide to us. For me, the thing that's probably given me the largest consumer surplus over the years has been um, the Lord of the Rings books and movies. For a relatively small amount of money, I have enjoyed hundreds of hours of first-class entertainment. But for many of us in this room, I'll wager that there's a common item that has an even larger difference. I think it is hard to beat the consumer surplus of a pair of spectacles. At Specsavers, glasses start at £30, which means that for only a handful of hours of minimum wage work, somebody can restore their sight. The ability to see clearly is more precious to me than any possession I own. And yet, should my vision begin to blur, it could probably be restored for the same price as a nice takeaway or two. Today's passage tells the story of somebody who had their sight restored, Saul of Tarsus, a vicious opponent of Christians, encountered the risen Lord Jesus. He was blinded for three days, and then his sight was restored. He could see again and see things clearly for the first time. Let me begin with a quick um, side note to discuss Saul's name. Um, Saul and Paul are the same person, and I don't think that Saul became Paul when he converted in the same way that Abram became Abraham in the Genesis, after God made his covenant with him. The Bible doesn't explicitly say why the name change happened. I think the most likely explanation is that as he ministered to the Gentiles, he just took a Roman name in the same way that a British man called John might choose to go by Juan if he emigrated to Spain. Yeah, Saul and Paul are the same person. I'll mostly be using Saul, um, but if I drop in the occasional Paul, don't overthink it. There's no particular rhyme or reason. So Saul was a... Pharisee, a Jewish man, a teacher of the law, and this passage in Acts 9 is not our first encounter with him. We met him for the first time at the end of chapter 7, at the stoning of Stephen, where Saul is described as a young man who approves of Stephen's murder. And yet Saul wasn't content with the death of a single follower of Jesus. We read in chapter 9 verse 1, that he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul saw himself as a man of God who needed to stamp out this blasphemous movement. If we skip ahead a few chapters, Saul says of himself in Acts chapter 22, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel, and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So why was Saul so opposed to the early followers of Jesus? I'll wager that for a man of his education, it was largely due to his understanding of the Jewish scriptures. Saul had a prior idea of what the Messiah would be, and Jesus did not fit that mould. Let me give you an example of the kind of Old Testament passage he probably had in mind that confirmed in why Jesus was not the Messiah. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23 says, 
if somebody is, is guilty of a capital offence and is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, the literal translation is a tree, you must not leave the back body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it the same day, because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Jesus was dead. He died on a cross, pinned on a tree, pinned on a pole. The Bible says Jesus was under God's curse. How could a dead man, cursed by God, be the Messiah? It looks like Saul was right. It's irrefutable logic. Well, he would have been right if it were not for one detail. Jesus wasn't dead. Let me read from verse 3 of chapter 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul had lost his sight, but he could see anew. Saul had a new vision of Jesus. This man, the supposedly fake Messiah, was alive. He is risen and powerful. As is so often the case, John Stott puts it beautifully. He says, There could be no misunderstanding what had happened. The risen Lord had appeared to Saul. It was not a subjective vision or dream. It was an objective appearance of the resurrected and now glorified Jesus Christ. The light he saw was the glory of Christ. The voice he saw was the voice of Christ. Christ had interrupted his headlong career of persecution and turned him round to face the opposite direction. Later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is talking about the importance of Christ's bodily resurrection. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So when Saul was working with the premise that Jesus was dead, his actions are understandable. Okay, we can probably see that he shouldn't have been trying to get anyone killed. But trying to stop false witnesses spreading lies about God is, at least on the surface, a noble aim. Now that Saul has seen that Jesus lives, an entirely different course of action is required. This is a pivotal moment in the history of the early church. Jesus had chosen to reveal himself one final time, creating the last apostle, a man with special authority and power. Luke, the author of Acts, documents these events because he wants us to know that Saul is God's man a witness of the risen Lord Jesus. And when we are reading Saul's words elsewhere in the Bible, we can know with confidence that they were written by an apostle with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Many people, many people today will challenge Paul's authority or say that he has corrupted Jesus' message. But this passage shows that from the moment that light appeared and he saw the glory of the risen Christ, Paul has been God's man. This is God's chosen instrument to write about half of the New Testament, to teach and mentor the early church, and to bring the gospel west to Europe. Saul also had a new vision of the church. In verse 4, we read that Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? But strictly speaking, Saul hadn't been persecuting Jesus but just his followers. But Jesus loves his church and is so united with her that any attack on the church is an attack on Jesus himself. I like the often used language, 
in the Bible of a wedding where Christ is the groom and the church is his bride. Imagine the horror for Saul as it dawned on him that he hadn't been honouring God by suppressing rebellious blasphemers. But rather he had been persecuting and causing the deaths of the bride of God, and that God loves the church so much that he sees that as a direct personal affront. I think that these verses must be of great comfort to the persecuted church, knowing that Jesus cares deeply about their suffering, and that ultimately nobody would escape judgment for their crimes against God's people. Saul's entry point into the church is with a man from Damascus called Ananias. God calls to him and tells him to go to Saul and lay his hands on him to restore Saul's sight. Understandably, Ananias has some reservations, for he's heard of Saul's murderous reputation. But God doesn't seem to be in the mood for much debate, as he replies in verse 15, Go, this man is my chosen instrument, Proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. We saw in Jesus' ministry in the Gospels the beginning of promises made to the Gentiles, and now God is putting that plan into action to bring the whole world his gospel. God loves to display his power through working through weak and unlikely individuals. Paul has been described extra-biblically as small in size, bald-headed, bow-legged, well-built, with eyebrows meeting in the middle and a slightly hooked nose. <coughs> Nor did Paul have a reputation as being a particularly competent orator. He says of himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Saul is now a member of Christ's church, and God will glorify himself through him. Before, Saul thought the church was a blasphemous movement opposed to God, and now he sees it as Christ's much-loved bride, God's special possession, used to bring the good news of the gospel to the far ends of the earth. Finally, Saul had a new vision of the cross. For three days after he met the risen Lord Jesus, he couldn't see, he was blind. He was led into Damascus, and there he prayed and digested all that had happened. As we saw earlier, Saul was well versed in the um, Jewish scriptures and likely had much of the Old Testament memorized. And now that he's met Jesus, I imagine everything was slowly starting to come into focus. He could see that Jesus had been there in the scriptures all along. The suffering servant in Isaiah 53 points towards Jesus. The child born in Isaiah 9 points towards Jesus. The Passover in Exodus points towards Jesus. The sacrificial system and the priesthood points towards Jesus. David conquering Goliath points towards Jesus. We could continue like this all day. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the accumulation of God's redemption plan, with seeds sown from the dawn of creation. The whole Old Testament finds its fulfilment in Jesus. And yet, what about that one verse from Deuteronomy, the nagging verse, the one that said that anyone hung on a pole is under God's curse. How can we square this with Jesus being the Messiah? Jesus was indeed under God's curse on the cross, but in a way unlike anyone before or since. For Jesus was not under God's curse due to his own sin, but for the sins of others, for the sins of Saul, for the sins of you and the sins of me. It's probably not reasonable to expect Saul to have figured this all out right away, and we'll read next week how he met the other of Jesus' disciples, and there he learned from them and would have doubtless heard many details from Jesus' ministry. But as he regained his sight, Saul understood enough 
but the first thing he did was to be baptised, to declare his membership of the church, and to be joined with Christ by symbolically going under the water, dying with Christ, and rising up. To accept the gift of grace made possible by the cross. Google describes a Damascene moment as an important moment of insight, typically one that leads to a dramatic transformation of attitude or belief. An important moment of insight. I don't think that's quite fitting. Saul saw the blinding glory of the resurrected Son of God, and common parlance has, today has diluted that down to mean an important moment of insight. There'll be a range of convergent stories in this church. Some of us will not rem remember a time when we um, first trusted in... When, some of us will not remember a time when we didn't trust in Jesus. Others would have come to faith rather suddenly, perhaps others over a period or mo of months or years. I don't think there's an expectation in the Bible that all of our conversion stories need be as dramatic as Saul's. Yet the same powerful force that, of God that drew Saul to himself is the same powerful force at work each time somebody puts their trust in Jesus today. The Holy Spirit that helped Saul to see Jesus, the church, and the cross clearly for the first time is the same Holy Spirit that dwells within us and helps us as we pray, as we read the Bible, as we serve and witness to our neighbours. Let us close in prayer. Loving Father, thank you for sending your Son to appear so wonderfully to the Apostle Paul. Thank you that you are powerful to save. Thank you for including us in your work to share the Gospel. Give us the courage to live for you, trusting in your power and goodness. In the name of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen.